Hello everybody, I'd like to welcome you to the September 25th, 2020 version of the Day in the Life of the Carmen's River. This, in this age of COVID-19 and pandemic, we've had to rearrange the way we do the program a little bit. Typically in the past, we've had students and, and teachers up and down the length of the Carmen's River at different sites, uh, but since the teachers and students are not allowed to be able to go out and collect data in the field, what we decided to do was to pick one representative site, which in this case is Wertheim Reserve, and you'll see that in, in the video. So the premise behind the Day in the Life of the River program is that we're looking at a snapshot of the ecosystem of a particular river at one point in time. And we've been doing this over the last eight, 10 years. So we've built up a, a nice repository of data. And the hope is that when you, we collect the data today that you and your teachers will be able to look at the data and compare it to other, uh, other years and other data. So my name is Mel Morris. I work at Brookhaven National Laboratory in the Office of Educational Programs, and I'm one of the creators of the Day in the Life of the River program. And with us today to go through the activities, we have a number of educators uh, for the Day in the Life of the River program. And I'd like to introduce uh, our first educator, Melissa Pratt. Hi, I'm Melissa Parrott. I am the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Central Pine Barrens Commission and one of the co-creators of this fabulous Day in the Life program. So without further ado, I'll introduce our other partner, Mr. Ron Gallardi, Mr. Ron Gallardi. Uh, I work for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. I'm an environmental educator and this is one of my favorite programs that we do during the year. So we'll see how we find. With us today we have Hi, I'm Nicole Pocher. I am the environmental educator for the town of Brookhaven, and I'm honored to be part of A Day in the Life of the Carmen's River again this year. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Alida Perez uh, from Brookhaven National Lab, and it's a pleasure to be here today and looking forward to what the experiment we're going to do. Hi, so this morning we're going to go through the activities that are outlined in the teacher's manual and the student manual as if you were here doing the, the collecting and an analysis of the data. So we've got the tasks broken into four different groups. The first group we're going to be doing will be physical data collection. Second group will be the site description. Third group will be the biological sampling. And the fourth group will be the chemical analysis. Okay, so the first test that we've got for uh, today is the tide range. What we've done is we've put a marker when we first arrived into the edge where the water meets the shoreline. Every 10 minutes after that, uh, well, two 10 minutes after that, we put a new marker in so we can get the full tidal range over 30 minutes. We haven't measured it yet, so we're gonna do that with you right now. So if we come down low, we'll do the measurements right here. So I have, these blue flags have been put here in the edge uh, at 10 minute increments. This one went in when we first started the test, then 10 minutes later, the second one went in. Uh, the third one went in after 20 minutes, and I have the final flag, which very shortly will go in for the 30-minute mark, giving us our full data range. So, let me measure the distance in the first 10. So, that's 15 centimeters. So, our recorder is going to write down 15 centimeters in the first 10-minute increment. Always use metric. Do not measure in inches and feet, even though that's what we're more familiar with. We're gonna be scientists today and metric systems the way to go. The second 10 minute increment is just about 14 centimeters. So we'll record that. And then the final one, are we good with time-wise? Uh, right on, okay. right, right now. So I'm gonna put it where the water meets the sand. And that is 17 centimeters. So there's our full tidal range over half an hour. Now the slope of the beach itself will affect the distance as well. So it's a gradient change, not just a linear distance change. But this gives us an idea of how much the water is moving at this site. So there's your tide range. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna test is the direction and the speed of the current. We're gonna do this in a very analog manner. I'm gonna to toss out this harmless orange. And by harmless, it's not going to hurt anybody, but also it'll decompose if we don't retrieve it so that the, uh, you know, we're not contaminating anything. 
So I'm going to use this as our float. I'm going to toss this out, and over 60 seconds, we're going to watch how many linear meters it travels and in what direction, and that will give us the current direction and speed. We're going to do this test three times. We're going to show you the first run uh, in just a minute here. And uh, keep an eye on the orange, and we'll be able to measure in one minute how far the current carries objects. measure the direction. So I have on my cell phone a compass app. We could use an analog compass. So, so angling my phone, it is uh, 227 degrees to the southwest is our current direction, 227 degrees southwest. We need the current speed in centimeters and knots. Okay, now those calculations will be done by students after they receive the data in the classroom. Tide, ebb, flow, or slack? Well, which way was it going? It was going out. And I believe that that's ebb means out. So we've got current and tide. You are right. Next. So now we're going to measure uh, the wind speed. Uh, it's important to know as a part of our weather measurements for the day. Uh, knowing the wind speed uh, helps us see you know, the oxygenation of the water and the, and the animals that live in it. As you can tell, right now the, uh, the water is calm. So suggesting we can hypothesize that our wind speed will not be as high today. So to measure the wind speed, we're going to use this tool. It's called the anemometer. Okay, it's an analog uh, tool. And you can see it has these blades in here. And how fast or how slow those blades move, it correlates to how fast the wind might be. So I'm going to hold my uh, anemometer right up high. And then... Right now, we have a speed of 3.3 .3 miles per hour on the wind. Um, the temperature that is recording is 28.3 centigrades. So I will let you at uh, school calculate uh, how much, uh, how that translates into knots, and also for you at school to calculate the Bofor scale. Now I'm gonna move it to Ron to talk about the wind direction. Okay, so now to determine the wind direction, there's a couple of methods that you could use. If you're fortunate enough to have flags on houses or buildings nearby, it'll give you a good indication of the direction. Um, we didn't have that available, so we tied a, a thin ribbon here, and it's definitely showing the wind is going that way. It is blowing from here to here. Now, the wind direction is named from the direction it's coming from. So when you're pointing your face into the wind, that's the direction. So this is the flag method we're using. The other method was taught to me by an old fisherman. If you put water on your cheeks, your nose becomes a blade that separates the wind. So I'm just going to sort of football that a little bit and if I feel the breeze equally as the water evaporates on my face my nose is pointing directly upwind and it does correspond to the flag direction so the wind is coming from here so I will use my compass app on my phone 
and it is a southwest wind at 220 degrees. Southwest. So the next thing we're going to measure is cloud cover. Cloud cover is something that we're observing. It's not something we use a tool for, except our own eyeballs and sort of estimate the sky. If we take a look at the sky and divide it into quadrants, sometimes that will help if there's a mix of clouds and clear sky. Today it's actually easy because the entire sky is either hazy or overcast. So the four different categories that we list on our data sheets is 0 to 25% covered. 25 to 50, 50 to 75, and today we have 75 to 100% cloud cover. Okay, so now we're going to test the air temperature here today, and this is going to be very interesting because we can look at the temperature and then we can look and we do a biological assessment. What is the uh, air temperature? What is the water temperature? When we're doing water chemistry, we can look at the dissolved oxygen levels and the temperature, the air temperature and the water temperature. So right now we'll do air. And we have at, what time is it? 10.30. a.m. We have about 66 degrees Fahrenheit. And what we're going to do is let you figure out the formula to turn that into Celsius. It's some good math skills. So this is hour one, and we'll get back to it in another hour. As we mentioned earlier on, there are four different groups of, of, of measurements that we're going to be taking. We've already done group one, and now we're going to move on to group two, which is the physical characteristics of the site. So the site that we're looking at is, is composed of both the biological and the physical uh, parts of the site. And we're going to talk here about the physical characteristics of the site. The physical characteristics are a combination of geographic features, geologic features, uh, human disturbance, and, and so forth. So when we look at the site, we want to take into account all of these various factors. So one of the things we describe first is what is the shoreline of the sampling section? If we look at the shoreline where we're standing, uh, we can see that along the edge here is, uh, is vegetated. This area where we're standing right now has been disturbed and it's sort of a road ending here and this is where uh, participants and visitors have come down to do biological sampling. And then if we go back be behind us here we can see that the edge of, of the shoreline is vegetated as well. Right? Now this is the sampling site so one of the things we want to know is what's the latitude and longitude of the site. Now, we, the latitude and longitude is important because we're using GPS to identify characteristics of the site, and we need to know the GPS locations for, for doing GIS sampling. Now, we've, we've already recorded the GIS site, the GPS sites, right? Yes, we have them all written down. Okay, so we'll send that to you. That'll be available for you to, to use. So if we look at the characteristics of the site, we see that it's, a, it's considered a road ending. It's a little bit rocky, but it's not bouldery rocky. It's rocky in big pebbles. And some of that may have been dumped here just to, to make this a more stable environment to work on. It's uh, not a steep slope. There is a pier that's here. It's been here. It's in disrepair. That's going to be rebuilt, I imagine. Okay. And then we can look at the river bottom. And when we look at the river bottom, now we're only doing the shoreline right here because we're not getting out into the middle of the river. But the river bottom right now is, is basically a combination of muddy, rocky, and if we take a look, and we mostly pick up pebbles and, and small rocks, all right, and it's mixed in with sand. When we talk about the percentage of the bay bottom that's covered in vegetation, well, when you look out here, we see that there's really no vegetation close to shore. I'm not sure what it's like as we go out further. Although, if you go all the way across the river, that area of reeds out there is grown up out of the bay bottom. So we could consider that part of the bay bottom and being vegetated. But near shore, the river bottom is not, doesn't appear to be vegetated. And if we look at the surface, right near shore here, 
there's no vegetation. Some sites have, have uh, reeds and water lilies and vegetation, you know, phragmites all the way out and so forth. This doesn't have it. So the river surface itself is pretty clear until we get out to the far side, which is then that island of, of reeds and, and so forth out there. Okay. So then once we've got a, a sense of what the, the site is like, and one of the things you can do is now that you've got the latitude and longitude, is go to Google Earth and take a look at the actual map of the site on Google Earth so you get a better sen sense of it. And then you could uh, sketch the map of the site. And sketching a map of the site gives you a good sense of, uh, a tactile sense really of what the site is, is like. Okay, the next part of, of group two is looking at the sediment samples at the shoreline in the bottom. Now sediments are particles of dirt, vegetation and so forth that have been washed into the water or taken up from the bottom and settled down over the course of the bottom. Some of the bottom sediments can be muddy, they can be sandy, they can be silty, they can be pebbly, and so forth. And the kind of, of bottom that we have, the sediments on the bottom, can determine the kind of life that lives there. Different organisms live in muddy bottoms, others will live in, in rocky bottoms, <coughs> smooth sandy bottoms, and so forth. So in order to look at what the sediments are like in the bottom, in the bottom here, we use a sediment corer here, which has got a little serrations on the bottom to help it dig into the soil and it'll give us a visual picture of about uh, what 10 inches or so of the sample of the bottom. So I'm going to give this to Ron to put in the water and to help Ron do this we've got our trusty rubber mallet. So he's taking a site close to the shoreline. If you notice it <laughs> I think I'll stop there. <laughs> so you rotate the cora and gently pull it up. Hopefully the sediments will be stuck inside. And we'll take the sediments and empty them into a, a dish, a pan. But before we do that, we can look at the sediments. Can, can you come a little closer with that? And if we take a look at the sediments that are in here, we have what small pebbles, sand. Ron, what else would you describe this as? So what's the total length of the sediment core and center? center There's a little bit of brick, uh, but it looks like it's mostly natural rock and sand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the idea would be to sketch this here so you have a nice little section, geologic core section and then do this in several other locations at the bottom to see if there's any changes in the sediment as you go from the shoreline out, All right? So we're gonna measure the total length of the sample of the core. Again, metric. So 15 centimeters total length. And how about the oxidized layer if present? I'm not comfortable determining that. It looks like there's oxygen all the way through. A uh, link of the anoxic layer. Present. So there is no anoxic layer. So what we're talking about with an anoxic layer so it, is sometimes the bottom is so covered with silt and, and mud that oxygen can't get in there. And when you pull that up, you get this black, muddy stuff that smells like a sulfur smell. That would be lack of oxygen that's in there. This core looks like it's just all sand, Plenty of oxygen through there. It's not an anoxic uh, se session. So uh, we don't have clay. We don't really have any mud. It really is sand. Uh, so we have sand, which is abundant. Uh, gravel and pebbles, which are abundant. G gravel is listed as pea-sized. Pebbles are larger than pea-sized. Uh, of course, that's also a function of how wide the tube is because if there are larger stones than that, I'm not going to be able to get through that tube, too. Uh, bivalve shells, things like clams and oysters, I don't see any. Uh, snails, no. Macroinvertebrates, are there any living, squirmy things in here? Don't see any. Uh, and there's no coal, and there's no plant material. 
And remember that this has been a disturbed area too, so this may not be indicative of the natural bottom as we go out deeper into the, into the river. Okay, so now we are going to pull the same net. Your instinct is going to be to just jump in the water and start yanking this net all over the place, but there's some things to think about first. Firstly, the animals that you're going to catch need to be returned to the water alive. We are scientists. We want the things to be in the same form they were before we got here to when after we leave. So make sure you have containers that have water in them in advance. We already have one little tray on the beach. Uh, we're going to get a couple of more of them. So if we do catch anything, we can put them directly in trays where we can count, identify, and measure them. The net itself, the same net, is basically a trap you pull through the water. It is a wall of this mesh fabric that we're hopefully going to catch organisms in. There are two, uh, not broomsticks, these are sane poles. They are not broomsticks. Uh, two sane poles, not broomsticks, that uh, are the uh, tied to the ends that we're gonna hold on to. The net itself is 20 feet long, and myself and Nicole will be pulling it through the water and trying to capture any organisms that we have. One side of the net has floats on it, we call that the float line. The other one has small weights on it, we call that the lead line, and the lead line obviously is going to go down. In order to catch more things, you might think, hold the net out as far apart as possible, but a lot of things will just scoot under the net if it's nice and straight. Instead, we're going to sort of make a, a pouch shape by being a little bit closer together. We're going to stand about 12 feet apart or so, pull the net through the water, and land it right here for your viewing pleasure and for us to capture all of the organisms. So we're going to give this a try. Uh, last thing is when you're pulling the net, it should be with the bottom leading as you pull it through so that the lead line acts like a, uh, like a, like a plow and cuts first. If you drag it like this, uh, the organisms will hit the wall of fabric and then sort of skitter underneath. So let's see if we do these things correctly. Ready? Okay. Get out. So I'm going to walk out this way, and then I'll cut across. You come back in along the shoreline, and I'll cut as wide as I can. Water close? Yep. Everybody should have a mask on? Yep. All right. Now, okay. here's another bucket. Down towards me. Here, let's throw this one in here. And, uh, Uh, crabs or just fish? At least one. Woohoo! I'm always curious what we can find. Always curious. And in the fall, it's even a bigger surprise because of the Gulf Stream. Sometimes we get lots of tropicals that find their way up to Long Island. So it's always interesting. It depends where you're saying for that, but you never know. So best practice, 
after the net comes ashore is to put all of the animals in water. You're trying to get an idea of overall population. So uh, don't worry about what they are until everybody has been put in a tray, a bucket, or released back into the water. Uh, if you do lose them in the water, it's not a huge crisis, but it does change our data a little bit. So do your best to get them into our containers. Uh, we caught a little bit more than I thought we would. <laughs> Always have wet hands so that you're not stripping the slime coat, the protective layer that fish have on them. But breathing is also kind of important, mm -hmm. so get them in water quick. And how about all the, the uh, product on the hands when you're touching all the fish? Well, that's something I didn't think about. Um, things like bug spray or lotion can kill these animals. So uh, if you're going to be the one handling them, you should have hands that are free of any kind of uh, artificial contaminants. You might smell nice, but you'll be deadly. Oh, here's a little baby crab. Is that what it's called? <laughs> baby crab. So I won't identify them, I'll let them. Okay, this tray is overstocked with life, so we're yes. gonna have to transfer them. Here, is that a Oh. <laughs> Slid right underneath. Let's make sure that the net is totally clear. Again, trying to be scientists and not... Butchers. ...harm any of the wildlife. Okay, so uh, we've now pulled the same net. We caught a lot of individual animals and we've sorted and separated them by species. What we're going to do next is record the count for each species, and then we're going to measure the largest of each one. What you're looking at are all individuals of the genus Fungulus, and they're all sitting in this little two gallon tank. So to increase the mystery, I'm not going to tell you what each animal is. But what we're going to do is measure the largest one. In this white tray, we have separated out each of the species we caught. Uh, we picked out the biggest one, and that's the one we're going to measure. Um, this little one is the one we'll do first, and it is already dead. The genus on this one is Alosa. So I'm gonna measure it like this. I put the nose or the tail right against the zero, and then I'm going to look carefully for where the tip of the upper tail fin is. And this one uh, comes out to 6.2 centimeters, so we're gonna measure this as 62 millimeters. That's one. Which one was that? Sorry. That was the one of a kind that we got. That one, number seven. Uh, so, Alosa, if you want to look it up in any of the guides, you can find it that way and then you'll know what it's actually called. So we'll do this one next, making sure my hands are wet. There's a nice silver stripe down the side of this one. Nose to the zero, I'll try to do this quick so you can go back to breathing. And this one is 83 millimeters. Nice. Correct. Next is this big hulk of a little fish. This one's going to be jumpy. I'm going to do it vertically, this one. Nose is there, that's good. Uh, 117 millimeters. Bloop. This fish is next. This one has nice stripes. This is genus Lapomus. Oh, slipped. 86 millimeters. Um, one of the species we have in the visual tank, we have to do that one separately. So here's our first invertebrate. Notice the little swimmerettes. This one, the genus is Calanictes. Stop trying to pinch me. It doesn't hurt yet. You gotta get bigger. Uh, carapace width is 26 millimeters. And then our other invertebrate that we caught, how many did we get? 33. 
Oh, more than that. 43. 43 of these. I don't remember the genus. Now this one's tough because it's got really long antennae sticking out. So I'm going to try to include the antenna in the total length. And that is 62 millimeters. See-through. What great camouflage. Okay, so our last one, come over this way. This was our most populous animal that we pulled up in the net. We had a total of... 219. 219 of these. This is approximately the biggest one. There were a bunch of them that were real close to the same size. So let's take a close look at this one. And it's got a nice round eye, a dark stripe down the body, mostly gold or yellowish scales that are fairly large. We can see them. Forked tail. These are all what we call field markings, just like you would look at a crest on a bird or something like that. These are different characteristics that will help us uh, identify an animal from others that are similar. So uh, I'm not, again, not gonna tell you what it is. I'll measure it and put it in the data. Uh, if you guys wanna see all of the counts that we had for all of the organisms, they'll be listed by their scientific name, genus and species, uh, the total number and the measurements we took of the biggest ones. Uh, and then it'll be up to you to identify them to the common name that you know them by. One of the things we made available for all participants is a series of field guides of the most common fish that are found in each of the water bodies. Because we're on the Carmen's River today, these five pages are the Carmen's River freshwater fish visual field guide. Uh, you could look in field guides, uh, official Peterson's guides, the big books, but we thought it would be easier if we just included the fish that are found here in this water body. Okay, so the thing I'm gonna talk about now is the Habitat, Habitat Association Survey. What we're gonna be looking at are things like wildflowers, insects, birds, trees, anything like that that we can include. It's not comprehensive. We're not trying to identify every organism, but we're looking at some highlights. So flowers are showy, so we'll talk about a few of the flowers, I'll point out a few of the trees. Um, if we see a butterfly on a flower, I'll try to identify it as well. I have a Peterson's Field Guide to Wildflowers. This is a first guide. It's geared towards early learners. Not I, I don't mean by young children, people who aren't really that familiar with wildflowers. The best way to identify trees or wildflowers or insects is to go out with an expert that already has a really good understanding and knowledge base. If you don't have that person available, then you'll make do with what you can identify. Don't take a guess, but you can describe something like cluster of pink flowers with broad leaves, and then take a picture. So the first thing I want to do is point out the few trees that are right here. Scattered around the back side of our study site are these nice thick trees. This is sort of a park-like field. There's actually a picnic bench here as well. Most of these are oaks. Uh, a combination of white oaks, like this one, and then there's a red oak over here. So mostly oaks, there's also a dogwood, and a swamp maple tree amongst our trees. Let's take a look at some flowers. There's some neat ones here. Now the field guide identifies flowers by their flowers. But flowers are a plant, and the flower part is the reproductive structure, and it's only there for a short while. So you may be looking at plants that don't have flowers on them right now, and it would be difficult to identify. So the ones that we can identify. First one right here. I already keyed this one out so that we can, we can spot it. This is salt marsh fleabane. It's uh, what scientists would describe as uh, cute. It's a cute little flower. Pink and fuzzy. Uh, it's got a nice smell to it. The stems are a little fuzzy. And what I'm trying to do is not just match the picture, but make sure that the description in the field guide also matches. Now behind it, over here, is an alien. And by that I mean a non-native plant. This is Budlia or butterfly bush. This is probably escaped from the neighborhood. This is typically used in landscaping. It's a very pretty plant. It does attract butterflies, but when it escapes out into the wild, it can be a problem. This is the last seed pods of one of the wild lettuces. I think this might be the yellow one, but I'm not real good at it. The um, 
Uh, it's in the lettuce family, although it's not one of the edible lettuces. Sis. Red flower, I want to show you. It's the last of the season, but the color is just amazing. This is cardinal flower. It's one of the lobelias. Right next to it are two different kinds of smart weed with these cute little rice grain looking flower clusters. Uh, I think the pink one is lady's thumb and this is white uh, smart weed, but I'm not certain. I'd have to key those out and look those up. So just in this short area, maybe 15 feet, there are daisies, there are grasses, there are sedges, there's an iris, there's a lot of different plants. It's completely overwhelming unless you have an expert or a botanist with you. So ask your expert on site if this is something that they have some background knowledge. And again, if you're not sure, if you spot this red flower and you're like, I have no idea what that is, take some good close-up pictures. Remember to get the flower and the leaves and stem because you'll need both to key them out in a field guide. All right, now I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa who's gonna talk about some of the birds we spotted. Birds and mammals. Again, this is an area of a day in the life of data collection we really could use more data on. So just in the time we've he we're here, we've had seven red-winged blackbirds that flew over the river. Ooh, there's a fish that just jumped there. Big fish over into the marshland over there. We've seen 12 cormorants. We've seen two Canada geese. Now remember, I'm not just saying we saw a goose. A Canada goose, right? You want to be as specific as possible. A mute swan. We've seen seven. A mole. We saw one. It was on the trail. It, it was expired, as Mel would say, but we did see a mole. We have uh, two gray squirrels. Two beautiful ospreys flew by. Uh, one great blue heron. Eight e egrets. Uh, and then we went on to the trees and to the flowers that Ron said. So please take some time to look around. We have our binoculars, we have our, our field guides, and get as specific as you can. And let us know what's going on in the air and the land, as well as in the aquatic habitat. Okay, now we're going to start group four. And group four is a really good indi indication of the environmental health of the ecosystem we just studied and took samples from. Okay, so for our water chemistry, we're going to start with dissolved oxygen. But first, let's get the water temperature. What do we have there? We have about 19 degrees centigrade. 19 Celsius. Perfect. Okay, now it's very simple to do the DO testing. And it's in the Blamont book. Provide and those, and you're going to put two DO tablets, one or two. So we're going to submerge uh, the tube into the water that so you're going to be testing. And then, as Melissa said, we're going to drop two of the dissolved oxygen. Okay, dissolved oxygen right here. There's no bubbles present, and we're gonna invert it, mix by inversion, and we're going to be doing this for about uh, about four minutes. We have to keep missing until everything is uh, dissolved. Okay. Okay. So this is our dissolved oxygen sample, and this is our table of colors. So if we compare. Um, I will say we're very close to four parts per million. I would say you're right. Yep. All right. Uh, four parts per million. Four ppm. So let's find out what our pH levels are here on the Carmen's River. So again, Aleda, all yours. Okay, so we're going to take uh, uh, one of these uh, tubes and we are going to, we are to, we're going to collect 10 milliliters of water. Okay, and that's good enough. And then we are going to add one tablet of our pH test. Okay. 
Okay. And I'm looking for the lip for this, but it's probably right here. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And then we're going to mix it by inverting. And then uh, until the, the materials have been dissolved. Okay. And then we're going to compare the color to a chart. Can we help you? Yes. So exactly? Or can no, we... I will say between six and seven. Seven, seven. So I would say yeah. what, a six and a half? Yeah, I would say 6.5. So that's closer. Yeah, that sounds about right. So obviously, if the color of the water sample doesn't equate a number, you can round it up. For example, so we're going to do the, uh, the nitrate test. Uh, so we're going to take water, five milliliters, the five milliliters mark, and we are going to add one tablet of the nitrate. Test and reaction. Okay, now better. And because not the reaction is sensitive to light, we're going to put an aluminum foil. And we're going, to, uh, uh, we're going to let it uh, sit for five minutes. We're going to mix them by inversion, and we're going to uh, note the color change. So let's just look at the nitrate. It's right here. Remember, it's, it's sensitive to the light. So there you go. How beautiful. So this is our color chart. Okay. And then this is here we have the nitrate. It's awesome. Five. Oh, okay. Five parts per million. Okay, so what we're going to do now is the phosphate level. Now, phosphates are necessary, right? You are needed. It's a nu nutrient required for plant and animal growth. So we have a tube here. Now we're going to collect 10 milliliters, 10 <laughs> milliliters of water. It's about good to go here. And then we are going to add one tablet of phosphorus, a lot of this phosphate in our water sample, and we will add it right here. Okay. And then uh, we are going to cap it. So the five minutes have passed uh, for the phosphorus test, and we're ready to read the reaction. Um, as you can see here, it's, 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 you know, this is a blue re color reaction. So if you compare the color that of our water sample to the indicators here, it's about uh, between one and two, right, Melissa? Absolutely, yeah. So we're gonna call it maybe 1.5. Parts per million. Parts per million. Okay. And as Melissa said, do your find out and go and, and, and as you do your research and investigation, see if this is amount of uh, phosphate that uh, is an indicator of a healthy environment or, a, or, or not. And another uh, item you could do is go to take water samples from other locations, your tap water, your pool, another ecosystem here, and compare it to the, uh, the data that we collected today with the uh, water temperature and the air temperature as it was. So do some research and find out other uh, water sources that might be really good and interesting. Okay, so now what we're going to do is actually do the salinity test using the refractometer. And I mentioned earlier, the refractometer works on the refractive index of salt water and fresh water being different. And so we, when we put a sample of salt water on here, we're going to look at the difference in the gauge between the salt and the fresh water, and that will give us our reading. So we put a little bit of salt water on, on the screen, close the top, and just look up the sky. And we see that essentially it says zero. So that means that the salinity is very low here now. So we're here to measure the turbidity. Turbidity is a measurement of how clear uh, of the water is, right? And so how clear or, or, or not so clear the water is, is a, is a measurement of how healthy the estuary might be. So to do that, we are going to use a secchi disc, and that's yeah. what Melissa is holding there. She's going to uh, drop the secchi disc uh, and then see how far 
uh, she will have to it has to go down before we lose sight of it. So it's from outside we're going to go from here, right? Part here, all the way down on this side, right there. And so, so it's do you have the six? Is that meters on this side? Yeah. So yeah, we have right. about uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty, one thirty, five, well, about one thirty five, one hundred and thirty five centimeters. Beautiful. So I want to say thank you very much we had a great day doing this and we look forward to uh, seeing what data you get into your classroom what results do you find from the data we collected and hopefully we will see you next year